Hey, what's up guys? I am Joe from Workbench, and this week we're gonna do this, and this, and this. So let's check it out. Before we begin, when I finished recording this tutorial, I actually ran into an error making the project file. And it turns out that there can be a slight error on the left edge pixels when you use this effect in 8-bit per channel. So if you need super accuracy, set it to 32 bits per channel. But for a lot of footage, you won't even notice the difference, and if you're really going for that glitch effect, it shouldn't matter. With that said, let's proceed. All right, so two weeks ago, I showed you guys how to do some ASCII generated text art. It was really slow, and I said it was kind of a roundabout way. And somebody actually sent a faster way to do this, which is pretty cool. It's by YouTube user UNVIART. Hopefully I'm saying that right. And basically it uses a cool trick in Particle Playground to actually map a grid of text to Luma values. But it can do a whole lot more, which is pretty cool. So when you're done watching this, I also recommend you go check that out, because that could be used in a bunch of different ways too. But Particle Playground seemed kind of slow to render to me, and I wanted to be able to do this with a lot more characters if I felt like it. And maybe use other things that aren't just characters. So I started messing around with some time displacement, and I couldn't get that to actually produce a result I was looking for. I got really close, but I think I needed some sort of expression magic that I couldn't figure out. And then I thought of an old technique, like 8-bit Atari old. Probably even Commodore 64 or older. Old. And that's known as image maps, sprite sheets. But basically it's just one image with everything that you want to animate or whatever. And like NES games like Mario, it was all the sprites for every character, all of their movements, the backgrounds of levels, all sorts of stuff. And this was used because it was quicker to load one image than it was to load a whole bunch of different images. Keep all of those things in memory and all that kind of stuff. You can just keep one image in memory and you're all set. Basically, you use it like you're looking through a window, like this little image right here. So instead of loading up this 01 image, we actually just slide the whole thing over until this part is under the window. And you know what does that perfectly for us in After Effects? Displacement map. So on here I have displacement map, and I've set it to 715 pixels, which happens to be five positions down. Every one of these, unfortunately, is 143 apart. And I say unfortunately because this works way better if you have even increments. Because otherwise, every other one gets half pixel residue on the edges. You'll see what I mean. So I'm going to turn this mat back off and just pay attention to this Mario right here. Or Mario if you're from the Northeast or pretty much anywhere other than where I live. And we're going to turn that off. And I'm just going to hit K to jump through these keyframes here at the bottom. So you see we're actually starting at negative 5. If I turn this displacement map off, you can see that's 0. So this first one's set to black, which means we move the maximum horizontal displacement in the negative direction. So the first one should give us negative 5. Remember, it's this guy right here. So we're going to move over. That's at zero. So 128 gray right here doesn't cause any movement. All right. And the next one is 255. And that goes all the way the other direction to this guy. So we'll go to our next one back in the middle again. And you can see down here, this actually goes kind of red. And that's because of my displacement map right here. I'm actually only looking at the red channel. All right. So we'll go forward. All right. So this one is 128 plus 25. There are five more levels this way to go. And that works out to about 25 in RGB. And you can see since every jump is 143 pixels, we have this leftover junk on the sides. So if you can avoid it, jump in even increments, unless you want that look. So then we go another 25, so we're on two. This spot now is referencing this one. And then here, we actually kept the red the same, but I have this thing moving down now in the green. So this becomes red and green mixed together, and it pushes us down one level. So you can make really complex maps if you want. So now that we have that little bit of primer out of the way, Let's get to the more complicated ones. I'm going to show you some of the pitfalls I kind of ran into along the way as well. So as you can see here, I have numbers set up for every level of gray I have. But this one's kind of blank. And that's the first pitfall I ran into. Even though you want to displace in even increments, you don't want to have an even number of levels. Because what happens then is that there is no middle, and so you end up losing one. So let me show you real quick. If I set this gradient to 10 levels of posterization, which is the exact number I actually have... I end up with 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, no 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. The other issue with having an even number of levels is that you're always going to end up with a blank spot. And I'll explain that in a minute when I show you how this is actually set up. But for now, just keep in mind, you want this thing to be an odd number of levels. So let's go into this numbers comp real quick. So you can see I have 0 through 9, so I have 10 spots here. The comp itself is 19,200 pixels. It's still 1080 high, but that's 10 comps laid out. So for testing purposes, I made every one of these things a number. So the problem with having even levels, and it's kind of hard to explain, is that you need a full-size comp in the middle here. Let's say this one's the middle. The top left value here is going to sample the top left of this one. And the top right is going to sample the top right of this one. But when you don't have an actual middle comp, you're like right in here. And values that are on the right side end up sampling off the image. 
You can loop it around, but then you end up with the wrong values from the other side. So that's why your gradients need to be an odd number of levels. I found it's a lot easier to make all of these separate levels in their own HD comp, and then just put them all in here. This comp itself is actually only one frame, and it has a freeze frame in the main comp. So that way it renders a lot quicker. But without much render hit, you can actually animate every one of these if you want to. Let's go back to the ASCII type example that I had before. So our first frame is empty, and our next one that follows. I initially had these all as a text layer, just duplicated a bunch of times, but I found that it's a lot quicker to actually use repeaters and convert the text to a shape. I've worked out how many times I want this to repeat, and it ends up being 128 copies by 49 copies. You can make it an even 50 if you want, whatever. All you do then is set up what that actual width would be. This just happens to work out to be 15 by 22, which ends up being pretty nice, although it's not exactly even across the jumps. However, we have plenty of white space around it, so it doesn't really show up. If you want, you can actually do some math to figure out what these would actually be if you wanted them to be completely even. So that's how our gradients are built. The ASCII gradient I showed you guys before didn't actually have 11 levels, it had 10. So I just added a slash in here after the asterisk. So in here, we have our displacement map and the maximum horizontal displacement is set to 9600. Now this ASCII comp, since it has actually 11 levels, is 21,120 pixels wide. So basically, we subtract that one 1920 comp that's in the middle, and we let it go five comps in either direction. Five full HD comps is 9600 pixels. So that's why in here, our maximum displacement is 9600 pixels. And I have my anchor set to zero, zero, just to make this easy, and the position is set to negative 9600. That centers everything up for us perfectly. And that's all you have to do to set up your gradient layer. But you don't have to worry about that too much because I'm actually including all of this as a project download. So let's look at how this map layer is set up. I've got a black shape in the background because this is actually transparent and that will mess up our displacement. So you want this whole thing to have no transparency. Then I just have my intro layer and above that I have an adjustment layer. I have levels set above it so I can tweak things. So you can do that and get a different look but I don't really want that back there, so I'm gonna drop it down. You can go real light with it. Get it to the, just the dots, which is kinda of neat. Then I have mosaic, and that guarantees that these blocks will all fit that grid that I made. So you can see it's got the same settings for horizontal and vertical, 128 and 49. Then I have a tint to make sure everything is black and white. You can tint before or after, that will kind of affect this slightly. So I'm gonna undo that real quick. And then I have an important effect, posterize. I have this set to 11, which is how many levels of gray that we have. This is kind of the magic part that makes this work really well. If you don't have posterize on, let's go back here real quick. You can see we start to get like odd jumps in this thing. It's probably not going to be super visible with this because we have 128 pieces across. But with certain combinations, you'll probably end up getting half pieces in here. And we don't want that. So we're going to use posterize. And basically this makes sure that whatever is getting displaced, displaces to the same exact point on one of those comps. So every jump will only be 1920 pixels. And that's how that's set up. Now this may not seem like the fastest thing to render, but when you consider that this actually took me like 20 minutes, I think, to render originally, it's pretty quick. So let's look at our final example. So in this example, I've made some dots, kind of like the pips on a playing card or dice. And some of them actually animate a little bit to give kind of an interesting effect. As you can see, we're not going super fast. Well, I think it's kind of this slow because I'm actually recording with QuickTime. Normally this runs about half real time. Either way though, just rendering this half and this half before took an hour each. And then have no movement, no custom animation, nothing. So I think this technique is kind of cool. I've actually already used it on a project. And one thing that's neat too, is that if you really want to, you can go into your map layer, go to your adjustment layer, and actually turn off this mosaic. And then you can go back into your comp and play it. Now it gets all sorts of messed up, but it's kind of neat looking. If you really want to mess around with this, you could make this so that it doesn't have this actual gap in between where the actual stuff doesn't go all the way to the edges. You can even try to figure out a way to connect them all. That might be one thing I'd try next. So I hope you guys can exploit this technique and make something cool with it. I'll probably post it up to the blog at some point with some stuff that I've made with this. And you can also switch these out pretty quickly. Let's change this map real quick to one of the other ones. Let's see the on cam one on this one. And there you go. ASCII. You can see I have mosaic turned off too, so it actually breaks this up a little bit. It gives it like an extra glitchy look. Looks pretty neat up in here, too. I'm going to turn that back on real quick. Mosaic. Go back to ASCII. You can see how quickly that updates. So even though I'm recording my full screen in QuickTime that's compressing it to H.264, that was still getting 6 frames per second in this render. So this technique is actually pretty quick, kind of like the actual sprites that inspired it. So download this and check it out. If you make anything cool, hit me up on Twitter. If you have any comments or questions, leave them in the comments down below.
If you feel like helping to support what I do, check out patreon.com slash workbench. And make sure you follow us on workbench.tv for more great content. I'm Joe from Workbench, and I'll see you guys next week. Bye. Bye.